Uh, Good morning, all. Let's find our places. We are so pleased to have you here this morning. Glad to fellowship with each other, share our lives with each other, share our struggles with each other, even share our, our sin struggles with each other and help each other with them. This morning we're talking in the book of James, chapter 3, about the tongue. And there's so many different sayings about the tongue. Hold your tongue, an offensive tongue, a slip of the tongue, bridle your tongue, tame your tongue, a crooked tongue, a loose tongue, a forked tongue, bite your tongue, sharp tongue, and you can go on and on. Uh, I, I think... I don't think I even have to explain to you what we mean by that. I think we understand. We've all experienced pain because of somebody else's use of the tongue. And let's face it, we've all hurt somebody else by the abuse of our own tongues. James gently, but yet very directly, confronts us about our tongue this morning. He says, this hadn't ought to be this way. It shouldn't ought to be like this. Um, titles for James chapter 3, we could put several. Um, he talks about the a fire, the tongue is a fire, so we could call, call it fire prevention skills. We could say small rudders steer big ships, or for your horse people here, bridles can really control a horse. Um, one that I kind of liked that's somewhat current, how to tame your dragon. <laughs> and any of you who have watched that uh, kind of get a kick out of both sides of that. But your, your tongue is, it, it says, straight out of hell. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. I, I'm just very unoriginal. Tame the tongue is what we're going to title it this morning. We'll work our way through it. We live in a strange world as it relates to the tongue. We live in a world that claims to believe in free speech, but yet if somebody can dig up something, one sentence that you said 40 years ago in today's language, they will cancel you. You you will be out of a job and actually um, disgraced and humiliated. Um, As I was writing this just eight days ago, there were two um, prominent journalists that lost their jobs, one in the New York Times, a Jewish lady lost her job, and then in the New Yorker magazine, a gay man lost his job. Now, it seems like female in today's world would be job secure, or a gay man would be job secure in the way our world thinks today, but they were let go. Why? Because they dared to speak truth. When Betsy and I were out west, we saw a lot of different illustrations that we could use this morning. I'm not going to go into them a lot. But in Yosemite, we saw signs all over the place about being careful not to feed the bears. There was nothing in there about trying to tame them. Uh, In Yosemite, and all over, up and down the west coast, 3,500 miles of west coast, much of it were just brown hillsides, giving real meaning to Smokey the Bear, saying only you can prevent forest fires. And James says the tongue is a fire. It just takes one spark. And it's not the spark that was the problem, it was the fire that it ignited. So there's that illustration. There's the illustration, you might say, about in San Francisco Bay or on the Columbia River, there were these huge ocean-going ships, and they're they're steered by a relatively small rudder. And when we wag our tongues, it can steer a lot. It can make, cause big damage. And we'll work our way through this this morning. But let's pray because what we'll find before we're done is that no man can tame the tongue. James says so, God says so. We know that to be true because we've tried. So we need God's help. And let's ask for that help this morning. Father, this morning we come to you in a a specific area of our lives where we know we need help. 
and we ask for that help. We ask for clarity in our thought processes to understand what our problems are and then clarity in the solution where we need to have you change our hearts, change the fountain from which our words flow and that the fruit of the Spirit would grow in us and that it would display itself through our language. Thank you for the privilege of being with your people, of being together and encouraging each other with your strength, your power, your goodness, your holiness, and your love, and that we can share it with each other and then help each other along in each area of our lives. Pray for those who are not able to be here today, that you would encourage them. I pray that we would be able to find ways, even this week, to greet them by phone or by text and to encourage them along in their Christian lives. Pray for those who are struggling with their health, struggling in other areas of their lives, that you would help them with those things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you to take your hymnals, turn to hymn number 506. 506. Really, it needs to be our prayer as it relates to the tongue. I need thee every hour. 506, let's stand as we sing this. that will help us in our time of need, grace greater than our sin. 122.
marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe, all who are longing to see His face. Will you this moment His grace receive? Grace that you are experiencing that grace from day to day as you submit yourselves to the Lord and trust in Him for His work in your life. Once again, we welcome you. A couple announcements at least. Um, one is parents of those downstairs in Junior Church just after we're done up here. The Junior Church leader is trying to, to keep them in the cage down there. Okay, until, until we're ready. So work your way down around the outside and just let them know that you're ready for your children. That way they're not stuck there for hours while we talk up here. So, uh, junior church folks. Um, missions committee, those of you who are on the missions team, two weeks from today, so August 9th, plan on a meeting right after the morning service. It, it won't be long. You can just sit kind of scattered is what's the, what the plan is right now and talk about d just getting back, getting your heads together again. Missions Committee, August 9th. Notice um, August 8th, we have a date finally for Joe Barry's funeral. Um, he was a long-term member here and passed away last Sunday morning at some point. And he will be buried, the, the funeral will be at the graveside in Carthage. And if you need more information, you can see me about that. We are also able to have nursing home services again, starting the 13th, outside. So they're going to wheel the people outside on the porch and we'll stand in the parking lot. Hopefully it's not raining that day. So if you would like to be involved in that, um, let me know about that as well. Um, Things are progressing slowly but surely on the painting project. Uh, interesting to kind of keep your eyes open from week to week to see what little bit extra has been done or a lot extra has been done. If you want to be involved in that, so you can't run a paintbrush but you can run a sand, piece of sandpaper maybe. Tuesday there's going to be some ladies here working from say 9 in the morning. 9.30, about an hour, and then others so, so yeah, 9.30, 9.30, or at 1 in the afternoon, if you want to come and chat with each other while you're sanding and things like that. So that, that project is available. There's always a lot of vacuuming and cleaning to do after that. Please check the mowing list and the, and the cleaning calendar and sign up for those needs. Other announcements related to church activities. We'll take requests in just a moment, but any, yes. College for this fall and schooling for this fall is still really uncertain for so many people. Jenna and Zach have to leave August 8th to go back. Bob Jones is starting earlier this year and trying to be done by, by Thanksgiving time. Uh, a praise, by the way, for Jenna. She was going to pay a little bit on her bill and her first payment is fully paid already by somebody. So that's a praise. So continue to pray for each of our students. Some are not returning to on campus. Some are changing majors. Some are going to be 
totally working from home. A lot of things different that this coming year. And continue to pray for God's hand, clarifying things and helping in very difficult situations. Okay, other church announcements and then we'll take some requests. Okay, so Kathy and Adam Wilcox are still in Pennsylvania. Both of Kathy's parents, two different families really, uh, are both needing help. Kathy's mom has a fairly severe hiatal hernia, which means her, her diaphragm, it, you know, it's got a hole that everything's pushing up through. And it's kind of been let hang, like a lot of other medical needs have these past few months with people. So pray for wisdom and, and, and God to intervene even in scheduling to get the surgery done. And then wisdom for the future, how to care for mom, where to care for mom, all of those kinds of things. Other requests from you folks? Yes. So Bob Mason has been having several layers of health struggle and they're finding that his white blood cell count is high. Uh, good news from Frank Davis this morning. His mom is doing better and they, ha they were able to take the pick line out for the MRSA she's been fighting. So that's a positive uh, progression in her life. Continue to pray for Deb's dad, Herman wisdom about where to live and in the care as well as his grief. Remind you that our offerings are plate in the back that you just stop by and visit on the way in or out or you still can send it to the church's post office box. It may be a week and a half or so by the time it gets there and and that gets into the offering but that is a way that you are sure of getting it to um, the offering. Let's pray and entrust some of these things to the Lord's care and then we will have our scripture reading. Father, this morning we have family members and friends that need your care. We thank you for the evidence of that care in the past, even in the past few days, and we ask for your continued care. Thank you for a special day yesterday honoring Kyle in his high school graduation. And then we are looking forward to he heading off to Miracle Mountain Ranch and for the changes that you are wanting to make in his life, that he would be able to cooperate with you. It's, a, it's gonna be a difficult time. And we ask for your help and your provision. Thank you for providing for Jenna a little bit towards this year's schooling and I pray as she and Zach return and pour their hearts into learning that you would bless them in that. I ask for other students as they make decisions about returning to school or not and what kinds and form of schooling to take that you would give them wisdom and strength as well. I pray for our governmental leaders Father, faith, we face it. We, we look right in the mirror and we say we really wouldn't want to be in their position. So, Father, we are praying for your help, for them to see clearly, think clearly, and then to make honorable judgments, to make decisions that are in line with your will and not their own or not the press, being pressured by the people around them. We ask for your wisdom and help. We pray for we as a church family. We sometimes just stand and don't know what to do, or we sit and don't know what to do to help each other. Things are so different, but we ask again for wisdom and then diligence in making the phone call or the visit to encourage somebody. We ask for Kathy as she tries to help her mom and dad navigate the health system and know 
how to make decisions that are wise and good and best for each one of them. We ask for doctors to understand what approach to take, and then we ask for, for your healing work in their bodies. Pray for Bob Mason. Pray for doctors to be able to understand what is causing this infection and, and then what to do about it. Now this morning, Father, we think about our own loose tongues, our own disengaged tongues, or tongues that are sewed on the wrong way. We need your help, and we ask for your help, and we ask for clarity of thought as we read your word, and then as we apply it to our lives, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'd ask you to take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 3 for our scripture reading today. James chapter 3. This is one of those passages that, as a pastor trying to lead, trying to be a shepherd and care for you, it's, it's a passage we could spend a couple months on. But we're going to just take one week today to deal with verses 1 through 12 relating to our tongues. I, sometimes the more we get beat up over stuff, the, the bloodier we get, but it really doesn't help at some point. Um, usually what happens on something like this topic, we know what has to happen. And then it's a matter of are we willing to let God do surgery or not. And I would beg you this morning to humble yourselves before the Lord and to allow him to change your heart. Starting in chapter 3 of James, verse 1, James says, My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body, sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. We'll work our way through that in just a moment. Um, Want to talk about next Sunday, week from today week from this hour, we're going to have the Lord's table together. We'll have little individual juice cups with a two-stage top. You pull the first stage and there's a little wafer there that we'll eat. and So we'll hand them out to you with, with our plastic gloves so that we're not handing anything around. But we want to wrap the whole service around the Lord's table next week, which means we need help. And Randy was quite sick yesterday, so he's not able to be here today, and I don't know about Pam this morning. But understand the music committee could use your help. And here's our recommendation. 
we've got some suggestions of songs that you have sung as specials in the last three or four months while we've been on quarantine. So there's, uh, and, and they're, they're in sections. So in sections about our sinfulness, about the provision that God gives, and about the changes God can make in our lives. So Merciful God would be a suggestion if one of you is able to sing that. I Run to Christ is one that has been sung. And if one of you can do that, um, Kyle and Pam are planning to do their, the song that Kyle had written and they did last week. Um, My Jesus Fair is a song that some of us have sung. Um, Randy and Pam are planning to do Oh the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. Um, Wonderful, Merciful Savior, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, Tell Me the Story of Jesus, Lamb of Glory. All of those are songs that have been sung in the last few months by some of you as specials. If you're able or willing, um, see Kristen and we can practice. Then also before the Father's throne above, in Christ alone, just as I am, bow the knee, he will hold me fast. All songs we've sung, and we don't have to do them all, but we can choose between them. And if we could get five or six of those, it'd be marvelous. Two are already claimed, and just see Kristen, and then we will arrange the service around that. That way we're not all singing and uh, all the time and, and doing that. Anyway, so we're planning on a special week next week, and I would encourage you to come. So James, chapter 3. What do we do with a chapter like this? Some of the wise old commentators, and, and they're all different, you, you know that. J. Vernon McGee, you ever listen to him? You know, that old farmer drawl type of thing. So just, just picture his his the way he speaks and he said we take two years to teach a baby to speak then we take 50 years to try to teach him how not to <laughs> uh, there's another one I read and I can't remember the the girl's first name but uh, a tombstone here lies such and so young who on May 23rd began to hold her tongue and how would you like that on your tombstone as your epitaph? And, and we all snicker at that, and we wouldn't want that on our, uh, on our tombstone. And James gives us the opportunity to look in the mirror now. And remember James 1, whoever looks into this perfect law of liberty and continues in it, he not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man will be blessed in his deed. We want to be blessed in our deeds. So we want to look into the word of God and respond to it. So many things that the tongue can accomplish. It can heal, encourage, edify, teach, support, sing, pray, praise. A lot, and you could keep adding to the positive things it can do. But it can also corrupt, pervert, flatter, slander, gossip, blaspheme, curse, and complain. And let's face it, each of our tongues have done both. And James says we shouldn't be that way. Remember that James as a whole, this whole letter, is about a faith that works, a faith that gets put into practice. This is not about how to earn salvation. It's not about necessarily even keeping the checklist on the wall. And, and if you can check off a certain number of these things in a positive way, you must be saved. And if you can't check them off a certain way, you, you must not be saved. That's not what James is talking about. What he's talking about is when you have trusted Christ as Savior, it's going to display itself in certain ways and you are not there yet. So here are some areas in your life that your faith will be lived out as you are attempting to live a life of faith and mature in that faith. And one of those areas is the tongue. How do we go about displaying our faith through our tongue? We've already mentioned that no man can tame the tongue. 
So what do we do? We have to ask God for help to tame the tongue. We need to give God control of our tongues rather than us keeping control of our lives. And then we need to cooperate with God in taming our tongues. The things we see here in this chapter, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, we see that in order to tame the tongue, you have to recognize that you will answer for how you use your tongue. You will stand before God, look him in the eye, and answer for the way that you used your tongue. Uh, Notice it says, my brothers, once again, the reminder, James is not talking to unsaved people about how to become a Christian. He's talking to Christians about how to display that for the world to see for God's glory. My brothers, don't be quick to become a teacher, would be a paraphrase of that. Don't be in a hurry to be a teacher. The point here is not that teachers are responsible for their tongues and nobody else is. Notice what it says there, knowing that we will receive the, what's the next word? The greater condemnation. So we all give account for our words, but teachers, because they are in official positions of relaying truth, have a greater accountability. So James isn't saying, some of you don't want to be a teacher because you don't want to give an account. No, we all give an account, but teachers give an especial, especially greater account. Um, Notice the admission of James in verse 2. In many things you offend. Is that what he says? Aren't you encouraged that James, the brother of Jesus, looks at us and says, we have a problem here. That encourages me. Somebody under the Holy Spirit's control, writing scripture, is able to look us in the eye and say, you know, you and I, we've got to work on some stuff here. We all stumble. That word offend is that word trip up. We sometimes call it a slip of the tongue. And James admits, I got a problem just as well as you do. There are so many others in scripture that we see that were spiritual leaders, Moses and Job and Isaiah and Peter and James. They said, we all stumble. We all slip up when we use our words. But then notice what James says next. If any man offend not in word, some translations, instead of using the awkward, the same is, say, he is a perfect man. James is not talking in first person there at the end of verse 2. So when he's talking about this mature man who's able to control his tongue, He's talking about he, not about we. That's interesting, isn't it? So James is, in, is writing scripture at the same time as saying, I have not matured to the place yet where I'm able to bridle my tongue. That word perfect there in verse 2 is a word we've seen before in James. James likes that word. It, it's a meaning of having arrived or come to maturity. It doesn't mean that you're absolutely holy like God is. It just means that you have matured, you progressed. And it's enjoyable to look at our own lives when God changes us and matures us and and we find ourselves saying, you know, a couple years ago, I would have just blurted out something in that situation. But you know what? God helped me to hold my tongue. We've matured. And that's what James is encouraging us to do. And then he says, if any man is able to hold his tongue, there in verse 2, if he doesn't offend in word, the same is able to bridle his whole body. Uh, Tried to come up with illustrations. We were talking yesterday with some of you about climbing Mount Washington or Katahdin. And I don't know if I can do that. You know, we're thinking, talking to each other. But the person who can climb Washington or Katahdin 
can go up to Bald Mountain and climb that. Uh, the, the chef can scramble eggs. You know, the marathon runner can run out to the street and back. If you're able to control your body, I, I, I mean your tongue, most likely you've got other things under control here. And that's what James is saying. Understand that we will give an account. It's not that I can't, it's that we don't. In, in so many areas of life, we come to the place where we say, oh, blurt it out again, I just can't control myself. No, I understand, and we have already mentioned this, you can't, but God can help you. And that's really the moral of the story this morning that James is bringing us to. Understand, you will give an account, and the person you give an account to, God himself, is the very person who's going to help you. He doesn't stand in judgment and condemnation of you only. He only stands in judgment and condemnation if you don't allow him to change you. You will give an account. The second thing we see here, starting in verse 3, is that in order to tame the tongue, you not only have to recognize you'll give an account, but you have to recognize that you can accomplish great things with your tongue. Great things in a horrible way or great things in a good way. A carefully controlled tool in the hands of a master can do absolutely marvelous things. Last night I was doing what I sometimes do on a Saturday evening, just trying to settle down and, and watching some YouTube videos. And I watched a YouTube video of a guy cutting an old growth redwood. Those chainsaws are marvelous. They're as long as your pew, you know? And they're cutting down a tree. And he was good at it. And he went right where he told it to go. If we can do that with a redwood, we can do that with our tongue with the Lord's help. A, a, a carefully controlled instrument can do great things for good or evil. There's two illustrations James gives. And notice he uses in verse 3 and verse 4 this word, behold. Take a careful look at and think about this a little bit. So think about the bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us. We turn about their whole body. Notice it's an intentional action. A bit doesn't just fall into a horse's mouth. The horse doesn't really like it there. But it's something that is an intentionally done in order to accomplish something. So we put the bit in there. And I wonder if we're that intentional about our tongues and about pulling the reins and holding them firm. Are we? Do we hold our tongue? Do we intentionally hold our tongue in the way that we would a horse using a bit? Um, Ephesians 4 is a passage that we've studied as a church several times as it relates to communication. That's the passage that talks about bitterness and wrath and evil speaking as well as kindness and edifying in those types of good words. You can choose which way you steer your tongue. You, you must bridle your tongue intentionally in order to edify, build up, and help others. But then notice the illustration of the ships. Um, we like ships, and when Betsy and I see waterways, we look for locks. There's something intriguing about a huge ship being able to be raised 40 or 50 or 60 feet, just using water. There's something really, really intriguing to us about that. But to look at these huge ships with relatively small rudders. Notice in verse 4 the, the seeming hindrances to being able to control it. They're, they're, even though they're so big, You ever think that something was too big to control? Sometimes it's the people you're around. And, and rather than carefully controlling our tongues to steer people in a positive way, we use our tongues and, and it 
shipwrecks them. They're big. They're, it's, it's too big. I can't handle it. So I'm going to have to go wild with my tongue. The other thing, they're driven about by fierce winds. This is outside of my control. There, there's, there's control. There's, there's pressures and powers outside of my control. I have nothing to do with, so I can't steer it. And we say that about our tongue. We can't control our tongue. And, and we say it also about ourselves, and we say it about other people. And we let our tongue start wagging and destroying people and things. Intentional action again. This amazing result of intentional speech in verse 4. Yet they're turned around, turn, turned 180 degrees by a very small rudder that's superlative for small. Which you English scholars, superlative for small, smallest. By the smallest of rudders can turn a whole ship all the way around. Notice what it says at the end of verse 4. Wherever the pilot, the governor, wants it to go. When your heart is controlled by God, you can with a very small tongue twist around your whole body and go the other direction from what you were going. The amazing result. Uh, talked about YouTube last night. When I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't sleep, I have a few go-tos, and a lot of them are documentaries. The, you find a really boring documentary and you watch it. And one of my favorites is a World War II Sea Battles, a DVD I have of those. And one of those stories is of the huge German uh, battleship, the Bismarck. The Bismarck only had eight days of active campaign out on the Atlantic Ocean. Imagine spending millions and millions on a ship, billions today, and it only has eight days of active service. Went out on the ocean, um, engaged by the British, it sank the big battle cruiser, the, the British battle cruiser, the Hood. It got some damage in the process, the, the, the Bismarck did, and it was heading for a port, for a safe port to do some repairs. And this little biplane, a swordfish biplane, dropped a torpedo, relatively small torpedo. It missed the ship, but hit the rudder. And this whole Bismarck was basically dead in the water, going around in circles, because it couldn't control its direction. And James is giving this illustration that if we allow the linkages to be hooked up to the power of God, we can steer this whole thing right around in the opposite direction from where it's going. It can happen. And James is encouraging us with this. He's not trying to discourage us. Um, that's what, there in verse 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. In the same way that horses and ships can be turned around, the tongue can, it's a little wagging member that if it wags one way, it steers one way, and if it wags the other way, it steers the other way. You can sour your marriage or you can sweeten it. Your, your work team, when you go to work tomorrow, you can make a mess out of it or you can really th bring things around and help it. There are so many things that can happen with a tongue that are, is just a small little member of our body. You can slice, dice, chop, and peel, or you can build up in, in, in cement relationships using your tongue. So how do we tame the tongue? You recognize you're accountable for it. You recognize you can accomplish great things with it, good or bad. And then you have to understand its power. And that's what we get to next, the end of verse 5 and following. Recognize that a small word 
can light an uncontrollable fire. Here's James' word again. Behold, take a close look here and consider, consider this. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindles. Four weeks ago, Betsy and I flew um, into California and we're looking down and everything was brown. It's just brown. Is that rock or is that brown grass? And you couldn't tell from 30,000 feet. But then when we drove 3,500 miles up and down California and Oregon and Washington, much of that was tinder dry. In much of that, there were evidence of forest fires. Huge trees with just the trunk sticking up that's black. N not just for a few acres, but for miles, five or ten miles. It it's hard for us to imagine when the news is talking about the forest fires in California. But when we were seeing it with our own eyes, mile after mile of destruction. And some of them would have a little sign that would say, this was a lightning strike. In fact, in Yosemite, one of our lazier days, we had done a few things in the morning and then went driving and here was a, a work sign, one of the orange work signs in the middle of the road that said, lightning strike fire ahead. Recent, it was still burning. Think about this. It's not the spark that's the problem. It's the fire that the spark starts. Have you ever been defensive when you melted down the whole family with a little word and you were defensive? I only said this. Yeah, but look at the conflagration you started. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindles. And, and that's why our tongue is so crucial to helping other people or it can hurt other people. Recognize that you can light a huge fire. There's several things we see here, and I'm using D's. The tongue is destructive. Verse 5, how great a matter a little fire kindles. The forest fire, it only takes a spark. The Chicago fire, remember how the Chicago fire started? Mrs. O'Leary's cow with a lantern. It wasn't much, it wasn't very big. It's all it took. With the tongue, it only takes a little statement but the fire starts. The tongue is depraved, verse 6. It's a, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. We, we talk about, say, Las Vegas as Sin City. You don't have to go to Sin City when your mouth is filled with this world of filth. And, and when we look in the mirror, when we listen to ourselves, we find that that is true. The, the word here, world, is cosmos, the, the way the world works, the system that the world takes, the way the world operates. If we're going to tame, tame the tongue, we've got to understand what it's capable of, and we have to understand that it's depraved. It's not your tongues that are filthy or cutting. It's my tongue that's filthy and cutting. The tongue. James doesn't say your tongue. He says the tongue in this case. We'll get to this in a few minutes, but the reason we find out in verses 9 through 12 that the tongue is depraved is because it's directly connected to our heart. The fountain from which our mouths speak is the reason why our mouths speak filthy things. It's interesting to hear a two- or three-year-old spout off the depravity of his heart. But it's also interesting to hear 80-year-old politicians spout off the depravity of their hearts. Uh, one person does not have a corner on the market of depravity. We have to look in the mirror and say, no, this is my tongue that is depraved. It's defiling, verse 6. 
It's a world of iniquity. It's the tongue among our members. It defiles the whole body. It's corrupting. Notice it's in the present tense. It, it, does, it didn't defile and now isn't anymore. It defiles the whole body. It is in the process of it. I don't know if you've ever found mud on the carpet and tried to clean it up, and there's just more mud and more mud and more mud. And where did the mud come from? It was on you. Often our tongues are like that. The, the more we wag our tongues trying to clean things up, the more filth comes pouring out. It defiles the whole body. Next thing in verse 6, sets on fire the course of nature. Um, nature would be life. That's the word often translated life. Course is, is, is like the way things go or the cycle, how things come around in the morning. Sometimes speaks of the sun making its circuit, you might say. So it determines the course of our life. The tongue, verse 6, sets on fire the course of life. You can control where your life goes from here by the way you speak tomorrow. You can lose your job tomorrow by the way you speak. Or you can speak in a way that, that builds others up and pushes others forward. Or you can speak in a way that cuts others down. The way you speak can make you to be known as filthy-minded and filthy-mouthed. The way you can speak can make you be known as, boy, they are so kind and encouraging. They're so helpful. Every time I talk with them, they help me. They encourage me. Our friends, our reputation, our jobs, our lives are often controlled by our tongues, as small as they are. The next thing there in verse 6, um, it is set on fire of hell. To stay with D, I, stay, I said diabolical. I'm sorry, I just had to keep, <laughs> had, had to stretch it a little bit. It's set on fire by Gehenna. And the picture of Gehenna is, it just means the Valley of Hinnom. There was, you look over the walls of Jerusalem, and right down there was the trash heap where they would dump their trash a place of rot, a place of stench, sometimes even bodies down there. And they just have a fire going to try to burn it up and imagine the stench that that would make. And that came to be pictured through the New Testament as hell itself and the tortures of hell. And interesting, set on fire of hell. You ever go to a circus, watch a, a fire breather? Who, who's, who's seen a fire breather? Anybody seen a fire breather? A few of you. Okay. Stick the old white gasoline in their mouth and, and it just, uh, most of us, not most of us, but some of us like aerosol cans. You know, you're one of two kinds of people, either the ones that do or the ones that don't. Picture your mouth that way. Picture your mouth that way. Picture the old gas stoves with a pilot light. Very tame pilot light, always burning, never giving a problem. Then the valve's turned on, and it just goes Set on fire by hell itself. So when you say, why did I say that, James tells you why you said it. You'll be controlled by something other than God. The tongue is disobedient, verses 7 and 8. Um, just the illustration of all these animals that can't be tamed, that are tamed, that aren't tamed. The tongue, no man can tame. It's disobedient. Now, I'm having a hard time with the deer in the garden, the woodchucks in the garden, the chipmunks in the garden, the Japanese beetles, the slugs, and the birds and the tongue. The tongue doesn't like to obey me. But notice what it says, verse 8, nobody can. So if you think that you're better than the next person because you can control your tongue, 
I'm going to tell you, you can't. You might think you are, but you can't. You're going to need some help with this. You're going to need God's help with this. That's the hope. All across America, tongues are being used to create huge conflagrations. They're burning people's lives up. And we can point somewhere else. We can point to Portland, Oregon, yet last night. What a mess. What a mess in Portland. But we better look in the mirror. Because we can do great things, good or bad, with our own lives, with our own tongues. We can burn down the whole community. You can burn down this church in a moment with something you say. You can burn down your marriage. You can burn down your family. You can burn down your work just with your tongue. So what is the hope? The hope is in verses 9 through 12. Even though James presents it in a negative way, I want to turn it around before we're done to encourage us that God can help us. So verses 9 through 12, Therewith bless we God, even the Father. Therewith curse we men, which are made in the image of God, after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh. Recognize your tongue is directly connected to your heart. It is directly plumbed in as a fountain. And whatever is controlling your heart is what is going to come out. Spiros Zodiades. You ever hear him? It was probably 40 years ago. He would be on the radio. A Greek of Greeks. I mean, just listen to the name. Spiros Zodiades. And he was a Greek scholar. And he would, he would open up a little passage for you each day for about 10 or 15 minutes. One of the things he said was, it's almost like we have two dogs inside of us, both trying to bark through the same mouth. And there's all sorts of ways we can try to illustrate it. James says, we do this. We speak out of the same mouth, blessing and cursing. Um, Robert Louis Stevenson. Few of you are literature people, a few of you, most of us are not. You will know what I'm talking about as soon as I get there. But he had a dream one night that was the foundation for one of his short novels, short stories. And it featured Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde that were totally opposite. One was upright and responsible, the other murderous and evil, and it turned out to be the same person. We still, 130 years later, use that terminology, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Why? Because we know what he's talking about. We understand. And then we ask ourselves, and we throw up our hands, and we say, why did I do that? Why did I say that? James is saying it's, it's coming out of the fountain. So his honest confession is that we do this. We eulogize, we bless God loudly and publicly at the same time as cursing the people who are made in God's image, reflecting God, and we curse them. The direct confrontation, verse 10, this had not to be this way. You should not to do that. There's no loopholes that we can squirm through. Don't do it. You shouldn't be doing that, James says. And then he explains the contradiction in verses 11 and 12 that, that you're connecting to a different vine if you're getting figs and, and, and olives. You're connecting to something different if there's salt, water, and fresh coming out of the same spigot. There's a valve there somewhere that you're switching. It's directly attached to your heart. Jesus told the Pharisees in Matthew 8 that their tongue reflected their father, the devil. 
how are we as believers, remember James is talking to believers, how are we to make sense out of this and to actually progress and mature? I'd like to turn just towards the front of your Bibles a little ways to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. The words that flow from our lips are directly connected to our hearts. And our hearts are either being controlled by our flesh at any particular moment or by the Holy Spirit at any particular moment. And the wording that Paul uses in Galatians 5, starting in verse 19, he calls them, verse 19, Galatians 5, the works of the flesh. We will read it in just a moment. But in, then in verse 22 and following, he calls it the fruit of the Spirit. We've tapped into the Holy Spirit's power if there's good words coming out of our mouths. But if the evil words are coming out of our mouths, that's just our, our flesh at work, doing what it does best, destroy and cut down. So verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in the past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Essence against such there is no law. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. We've cut off the source that our tongues have been using to feed the filthiness that comes out of them. In order to tame the tongue, we're going to have to have God help us to turn the valve, to switch the switch on the rail so that the train is going in a different direction, or any other number of illustrations you want to give. Um, you electricians, a three-way switch. There's always power to the switch, but it can be told to go this way or it can be told to go that way on a three-way switch. There's always something empowering our tongues. It's always, your tongue is always connected. I've only heard a few times when people's tongues have been made speechless. Usually, they work pretty well. And they're either controlled by the Holy Spirit or by the flesh. So recognizing our need, recognizing our need drives us to God. And what I want you to do this morning, believer, I'm speaking to you, James is speaking to us, brethren, James 3.1, be controlled by the Holy Spirit in the use of our tongues. Let's take our hymnals again. Turn to hymn number 405. 405. Good way for us to finish up this morning. Giving our lives to the Lord and letting Him control us, letting Him steer us. Let's just sing the second verse. The second part of that talks about our voice and the way that we use it. So let's stand 405, the second verse. <laughs> Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King, always only for my King. Let's bow our heads. Friend, if you are here this morning, you've never trusted Christ to forgive your sins. We all have sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. You are not the only one who are sinners here this morning. 
if you haven't trusted Christ. We all are. We all need Christ. But if you've never trusted him, we, I beg you this morning, trust him. He died for you on the cross. He took your punishment. You will stand before God someday and answer for your life. Jesus already paid the penalty for you. Trust him for forgiveness. He will change your heart. Believers, sometimes we become complacent. Sometimes we're not careful in the way that we valve our, uh, the plumbing of our mouths and outspews something that is absolutely filthy, sour. That shouldn't be that way. Plumb yourself to the Holy Spirit Beg him, trust him, cooperate with him, work with him, and maturing in the same way that you mature in your handling of trials or temptations, as James 1 taught us, in the same way that you cooperate with him and have him help you with your prejudice in chapter 2, we have him help him help us with our speech in chapter 3. Two weeks from today, we'll cover the end of chapter 3, really more practical ways described about how godly wisdom works itself out through our speech and our actions. So be reading ahead and cover that as well. Let's close in prayer. Father, I pray that this morning we would recognize the danger in our own mouths, not just looking at somebody else and the danger in their mouths, but our mouths. It's us that have a problem. And I pray that we'd cooperate with the Holy Spirit, allowing him to grow fruit in our lives and to tap into your word and to your power and your grace to help us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a marvelous week.